you don't learn to be a human being by staring at a screen. Um, in fact, I'm finding it quite difficult staring at the screen at the moment, <laughs> even though we are apparently communicating across the Atlantic. Um, it's, it's an interactive, human, embodied experience, learning to be a human being. And especially in children's earliest years, they need a huge number of interactions with people who care about them. Children have to have time to wonder and play and be bored. Or even if they did have time, are they in front of a computer screen or some other video game um, instead of being outside exploring nature? I think. You know, I think it was Huxley that said, like, in order, you can't, like, read nature. I can't say, oh, here, Stacey, let's learn about nature. Here's a book. You know, you have to see. You have to learn how to see, and you have to, you know, be a part of it. And the only way is to be in it. I don't, I don't remember my mom wondering where I was going to be between 9 and 12, and then between 12 and 4. I was just off on my bike in the neighborhood, and, uh... I don't, I don't know how much that is fear driven or just culturally, you know, schedules and computers, but I think somewhere in there there's not that sense of I can let my child just go be out. It's often called the disappearance of childhood. So there's incredible concern right now and part of it is I think the overuse of technology, uh, depriving children of play in a lot of schools. That time outside is not valued. It's the time where we let them out for 20 minutes so teachers can eat lunch. Or it's not valued in its own um, right as an educational experience. Not that going outside always has to be educational, but there's inherent value. A school in Atlanta got rid of recess, and the principal said something like, what did a child ever learn from hanging from the monkey bars? I was like, I don't know, gravity? or like, <laughs> what? It doesn't have to be that they learn anything, but actually you learn so much about who you are in the world and what this place is that you're in, this is where kids are asking questions about like worms and ants and friendship dynamics and just the experience of being. The students are so scheduled from the moment they wake up until the moment they go to bed, as are their parents. So in many schools, once the school bell rings at the end of the day, there's either some extracurricular or at least hours of homework. Beginning, you know, in the early years, scarily in the kindergarten, there's not as much time to just have free open play. I think certainly for the first seven years or so, we really need to keep it real as much as possible in children's lives. Obviously, you, you, know, you can't completely escape from the fact that we live in a, a, a media-saturated world. But the more opportunities we give children for play, for just being with the people that care for them, um, with other kids, and the more opportunities also for being in the natural world, which is where our brains and bodies were programmed to develop, um, then the happier, healthier, brighter and more balanced they'll be as they grow up. Kids really learn from experience and they learn from early on face-to-face -face interactions. Unstructured play is very important early on to, to learning, um, which is something that tends to be overlooked, especially as these media products are coming out that are supposed to teach kids things from the time that they're babies. There tends to be this real focus on the academic aspects of learning. So are you learning your numbers? Are you learning your um, yeah. things like that? And, and less focus has been put on this idea of just letting kids play and explore on their own. So learning is, usually we think about it as the process of encoding a memory or the experience that one undergoes and then you will, say, change your behavior in some way, like in the future. Either you, now have you accumulated knowledge or haven't accumulated knowledge. And the way we know a memory has been formed is not by observing the memory, okay? What we observe is changes in performance. So learning you know, is the measure by which we can access what a memory is. Like My name is like, practically bookworm. I still read books and I also read on the computer. Which one do you prefer? I love reading from books that you can actually open with your hands. Because, like, you, if you have any thoughts in this class, we write our thoughts down on a sticky note. 
and it's a bit challenging sometimes. At the beginning of the year, I could barely get even with 10 sticky notes out of one book. And I was reading such hard books. And now I'm like getting 500 sticky notes out of one book. It's amazing. I think it's quite important to be media literate, um, but I'm not sure that the way it's done is in our, our schools and in our country is always that good. Um, I think children need definitely to be taught to think critically about what they're watching. The rest of the world and the workforce and everything else is using all the technologies that we have full speed ahead. And if our children don't know how to use them properly, they may be at a disadvantage later. It's not just the children interacting with the screens, it's their parents interacting with the screens. Um, but I mean, you can now entertain a baby with baby TV 24 hours a day. Um, and uh, sort of things like baby Einstein DVDs are sold for children of nine months, but used with children much younger. She knew exactly how to start it up. She knew from the get-go. From the moment she wakes up, Violet Bolton can't wait to get on her iPad, although Mom does set limits. That is the first thing she asks to do in the morning, but uh, that doesn't happen. <laughs> Violet turned two this month, but she's been a whiz in her iPad since she got it for Christmas. Apple is now aggressively marketing programs for toddlers. Violet's <laughs> iPad has a dozen apps. She's learning colors, math, animals, and more. Spanish and French are next. Parents in particular are swayed by the things that they read on the packaging and, and on the information that, that's coming with these programs that are supposed to be educational for kids. And they're, they're sort of led to believe that if they put their child in front of that, um, that media that the child can then learn from that and it's almost like having a teacher in the room with the child. The real problem comes when parents use those sort of media and think that um, this is the, going to be a substitute for something. It's going to educate their child without having to actually um, have that face-to-face -face, um, you know, um, learning experience with their child. Inappropriately, when they have some scientific grounding, using you know basic shapes and colors, and just giving infants new platforms in which to interact with what they see in the real world. I mean, there is no substitution for you know real interaction. I mean, there's seeing an apple and, and looking at it, picking it up and tasting it. You know, is very different than you know moving one, rotating one on a on a screen image. I guess everybody says, oh, I know when somebody's smart. Why do we need to know? I would argue that we need to know how somebody learns. We don't take that into account. tests like in the one percentile in auditory processing. She's a kinesthetic learner, she's a ballet dancer. In visual strength, she's in the 99th percentile. She has auditory processing disorder. It has to do with auditory information going in and getting kind of, the circuits aren't connecting quite the right way. A lot of reading programs in the classroom are from books. Well, for a kid with a processing disorder, that's terror, that's a nightmare. But with visual and audio support, and the tactile support, they can actually manipulate that as part of technology to help build reading skills. That's one example of how you can use something very simple in the classroom to differentiate. It made all the difference in the world for her. All there. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam. I am. Savant, who can play Beethoven after hearing it once, is that person intelligent? You can't do it. 
I can't do it. We may be intelligent people, but they can do something that's beyond our realm. And it's not just skill. It's not talent. There's an intelligence going on. At a certain point, one starts playing verbal games here. You can define it how you like. I just think the important thing is that we recognize that there are a range of ways to be intelligent, some of which are just about embodied intelligence. The dancer displays an important form of intelligence. If I were trying to redefine intelligence, I'd say it's not just the capacity to systemize and understand, but also the capacity to be human and connect on a human level, and you cannot systemize that. People try to, but uh, I think the minute you do, you lose the plot. Human beings made up of thinking, feeling, and willing capabilities. Uh, and, and each one of us has our own strengths. Maybe the mark of an intelligent person is using whatever content you have and skills you have in your brain and body in a creative way. A big component is imagination. You have to think in several different ways at once. You gotta know your world around you, so I say that's number one. Two, you gotta be able to solve problems that you know anything about. Intelligence, you could think of too, is skillful coping with one's environment. The boy who harnessed the wind. So this is an example of the kind of student, uh, the kind of intelligence that, that uh, we really want to encourage. It's about a boy uh, who used his intelligence to A, recognize a need in his community, B, he had the self-motivated drive to seek out a solution, and then C, he actually went through the process of building a simple windmill that was able to bring a, a modest amount of electricity to his village. That will to make the solution actually manifest. I'm intrigued by somebody who changes the paradigm for the rest of the world. That's inarguably a mark of genius. I, I'm thinking of people who are profoundly intelligent. Uh, of course, Steve Jobs comes to mind as someone who's just passed, showing us emotional and also uh, cognitive intelligence. So Steve Jobs enables it, right? That kind of foundational genius. But then there's a whole stratum of people who take that new technology and open up whole different vistas with it. And I think they also merit the term genius too. But I think they're, they're uh, you know, heroes of their culture. The, the kind of intelligence that could be measured in an IQ test um, I would really sort of call that cognitive aptitude, cognitive potential. They pass the test, but when it comes time to out of the box, they're not going to be able to solve the problems. They're not going to have the innovation. You know, there's more than one kind of intelligence. Language and math are not the only two kinds of intelligence that ought to be uh, evaluated for a good education, uh, but it's the only ones that are tested. I think we make a mistake in education whenever we tailor education to a specific kind of person or learning style. You might have a student who has great capacities um, but, but has no inclination to exercise them because they haven't been convinced that certain topic areas are interesting or worthwhile. <laughs> very simple truth. What do they love to do? We help kids understand what it is they do well and what they love to do. And when you combine that into one powerful experience for a kid, they choose something that they're not just interested in, they're passionate about it. This is for a go-kart project that we're actually going to start building. Yep, and we just finished this up not too long ago. Under this, there's a layer of wooden foam which acts as a filler to add this under base. It has to do certain functions. This is the robot we're going to be competing with. And our competition is to be able to pick up these um, objects and put them into the goals as fast as we can. When they're passionate about it, everything else comes easier. 
uh, if they're passionate about carpentry and building things or design and architecture and mm -hmm. seeing something grow out of something of their design, um, they learn math better. They learn um, how to communicate their ideas better. So the academic components become almost a secondary kind of uh, an interest, but an interest nonetheless. If there's any way in which you can um, help students embrace what their, you know, their current lifestyle is, adapt learning to something that they can utilize and understand to make it more relevant, it speaks volumes. Most of our job sites are not at a street address where you can just say 20 Main Street. So we're in the middle of the woods and you look around and go, well, what's our landmark? We don't have one. So we can just put a, drop a pin on the map, describe what we're doing. Uh, yesterday, for example, we were on a stream and we had five locations going upstream that we were measuring saltwater contamination from highways as you went upstream. So that's what we use our iPad for. Although this is hands-on, students learn in a number of different ways. Dealing with ideas is just as important as being able to deal with wood. It's hard to, it's hard to just read a book and, and be able to do, right. do that. You need to come in here and actually get your hands wet and dirty and the whole thing in order to, in order to know what it's like. You know? It's usually an hour in the classroom and then the other five hours are out here doing, doing the hands-on. Uh, this is where they actually they learn. A lot, of, a lot of kids are more hands-on learners too. A brain-based approach that has evolved over the years. And kids who have had mm, different experiences in school before here, where they've been, it's very been a didactic kind of thing, where they've just been listening to lectures, that's not how people learn. Very few of us learn that way. The tests, in, in my experience, take the emphasis off the real kernel, which is to create this spark, to encourage our children to becoming lifelong, self-motivated learners. The normal schools say, no, don't focus on that. It doesn't matter what you're interested in. It doesn't matter what you want to focus on. This is the thing that we're all focusing on as a class. So Johnny, sit down and pay attention. He will quickly learn that what he cares about, what he's interested in, doesn't matter. It's what the authorities say you should pay attention to and should be interested in that matters. I think by, by connecting the curriculum to something that the students are already interested in, it's that much more meaningful to them, which then leads to engagement and focus. So I think we start all the way back at the beginning, and the way that we set up the environment, the classroom itself, provides for, for that focus and engagement, because it is, it's inviting the students in. Almost nobody knows what it is. What's okay. open? So I'm curious. <laughs> This is another hamster. Actually, my unicorn. Whoa, do you make those? Yeah, out of wool. The environment is a teacher. Listen. It's so quiet. Aren't there any children in this room? Would you tell us what we read? Oh, there are children here. And they're all busy, too. We have found that knowing when to be quiet is a part of growing up. The quiet room helps all of us learn. To walk into a classroom like everyone's working, and then it's quiet. And that might look like focus. For some kids, focus just looks like he's rolling on the rug and doesn't look like he's paying attention. I can either make him sit still, and then he can spend all his time focusing on controlling his body, in which case he doesn't hear, or I can kind of let him move around as long as it's not bothering anyone, he's actually focusing. And I think we have a little bit of freedom to, to define that different ways. Once I did a, a book on word origins, but I discovered that focus didn't actually get its, its modern meaning until um, the Renaissance, uh, presumably when people needed a word, artists were, were painting perspective and lens grinders were making microscopes and telescopes, so they needed this word that meant focus in. So the word they used was the Latin word for heart, um, the fireplace. Now somewhere around about the 1970s in the UK, we stopped putting hearts in family homes. And what draws our eyes now as we walk into a room? And I think that's a really significant change. If, if we want to be able to reconnect, we've got to recognize what's happened 
and then we can start thinking, right, how can we deal with this? So we're making um a bridge. A bridge as yeah, spaghetti so for an elf owl to yeah. sit on. In the moment they're born, they're imitating an adult, and it's a playful imitation. So that, that is exactly why they are utterly programmed to, to learn to focus, control their attention, and to regulate their behavior um, through movement, through this absolute drive to explore and connect, which is so precious. Children naturally focus. So, the kind of early wonder that there is in children, and it's kind of open-ended, and they're just curious, and they, they find something and they, they focus on it. They have, you know, uh, this orienting response um, in, in the, the first few years of life where kids are automatically sort of programmed to focus their attention on um, salient you know, visuals, like you know, quick cuts and uh, zooms and exciting animation and sound effects and things. So kids will focus their attention on that, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're following what they're seeing. I think you're told that you need the ability to multitask. I think we all know that um, that if everybody is working on a certain skill, um, that what you should be doing is thinking one step ahead and thinking about, <laughs> right, so maybe the ability to concentrate and focus is going to be what's marketable um, in the future because that's what so many people won't have. I still tend to think in sort of singular terms. So I'm a novelist and we don't have a TV at home. So I tend to think in terms of long projects. My seven-year-old, she tends to think of things in bursts, you know, so um, she plays in bursts, you know, and, and I think that has to do with this sense of moving quickly from one window to another. In her way of thinking, there are always going to be multiple windows open. Sometimes nonlinear thinking actually works best to break out of a mold of simply writing in a very stilted fashion. I don't think it interrupts me, but that's because I'm a professional writer. I think it does get in the way of kids writing, and I think distraction is a really important concept because it's all about focus. When you write, when you produce, when you do a piece of work, it's about focusing and being able to take your brain and make your brain only consumed with those thoughts. Distractions activate your brain. And then the parts that you were working on before it got distracted, deactivate. And so then when you go back, you have to go, where was I? You lose time, you lose brilliant work sometimes, you lose train of thought. And so it's real important to teach yourself to focus. I do think you can fragment your awareness, fragment your response to the world, to the point where it becomes ineffective. It requires many, many shifts in attention, um, and it also puts a heavy load on our ability to process all this information, so it's taxing to our cognitive processing. We need to think long and hard about taking a kid who's eight, giving them an iPad, which is distracting as well as focusing. At that very young age, you grew up learning to have six tasks going at once. And, and honest to God, I think that has evolutionary results on the brain. So I wouldn't be surprised if what we're doing as we evolve our, our computer network, we aren't also evolving the hardware of our own brains. I think their brains are being rewired. I think the activity that comes from the sensory stimulation from all of this technology and the way they're thinking about it is rewiring brains, and I truly think it's for the better. This is my first wearable computer. I finally got a successful system that I could wear every day about 1993. It's been the longest experience of somebody wearing it as part of their daily life. Um, let's bring back memories. This is, a, this is a 80 megabyte hard drive. I don't know if you can see how big that is, but I'm kind of abused. So I have an eye telephone which means I have Google on my phone. I'm guessing a lot of you do. I don't know if you've noticed, it's ruining life because we know everything. <laughs> but we're not a lick smarter for it. How is uh, a Google on your eyeball uh, different than omniscience in some sense? You don't know something? Wait two seconds. You will know. With Google, we 
we've now gotten to the stage where everybody can look at stuff pretty quickly has changed what we value as far as information. And I can tell you that the square root of 7 is 2.645.7513. That was useful when I was young. It's not useful anymore. Having Google on your phone is like having a drunk know-it-all in your pocket. <laughs> There's no time for mystery or wonder. You're just like, how do they make glass? <laughs> and you know. Intelligence you know, requires the ability to ponder. It shouldn't be input-output immediately, uh, which is what I think some people who fear the way technology may be going, that you put something in a search engine, you get immediate result, and there's your answer. If students aren't making those inferential leaps, um, if, if they're not reasoning to their conclusions, if they're just finding them online, um, then they're not practicing an important habit of mind. There does need to be time for doing thought experiments, for um, saying what if. The time between not knowing and knowing is so brief that knowing feels exactly like not knowing. <laughs> so life is meaningless. It could almost be too easy. Sometimes the journey is important and the amount of energy that you put into trying to, to formulate uh, or build a memory or knowledge about a specific topic, kind of that passion that one can have and, and used to go through the exploration in a, a slower pace, I think gets a little bit missed lately. There was a time, and I don't mean to get all Andy Rooney on ya, but there was a time that if you didn't know where Tom Petty was from, you just didn't know. And you felt that yearning and that deficit in your being, and you'd go around and ask actual people where we look for information now we can have a library at our fingertips which i think is just a remarkable achievement our mission is to give books to underserved youth boys and girls birth through grade five or six we put in a library but what we did was we put in four computers the library wasn't enough a freestanding book library as wonderful as it was it was those four computers that were going to open the world for those boys and girls. It isn't just waiting till their parent takes them to the library. They open that computer and their wealth of knowledge is tenfold. His name is Dr. Lowell Monkey. He said, first of all, it's the old adage, if you, you give a child a hammer, then everything in the world looks like a nail. The same is true of computers, and if you, you give a child technology, you give a child access to computers at an early age, then you introduce them to the world of information, and the world looks like information. The convenience of information, I think, is great. My fear is, is that rather than trying to build a deep understanding of what you're talking about, when you have so much access to knowledge, especially knowledge that's been processed quite a bit, you miss that experience. You miss going out and finding original sources and bringing all that information and integrating it. Technology, it, it doesn't promote that type of thinking. You are following a train of thought that someone else is, but, um, but you yourself aren't making those inferential connections and leaps, and, um, and I think that's a real loss. The biggest negative thing I can think of is students that use it as a crutch, that it takes the place of hard work sometimes. It's so tempting to find something on the internet and cut and paste. It's so tempting to take someone else's word and put it into your paper. And it's so tempting not to do it at all because your friend's trying to chat with you. You want to unleash the power of the internet, but unleashing the power of the middle schooler is also a frightening thing. You know, what technology is really is generational. The net generation who were born in the 80s and the I generation who were born in the 90s and now we're looking at a new generation called Generation C, which stands for connected, creative, collaborative, communicative. They're the kids who are born in the new millennium that we're tracking now. We're to the point now where mankind really doesn't need to keep adapting to the computers. We're at the point where the computers need to adapt to us now. We can't ignore technology in our world. It's here to stay. And it's something we need to embrace. 
and not have schools be a completely different feeling environment than outside of schools for children. I think that our definition of intelligence is changing as our technology changes. It's no longer about what you know, um, it's about how you know how to use what you can find. All we have learned how to put in code. Computers are a language just joined to a technology. I think what we've tipped to is what the rest of the world has known for centuries, which is that the more languages you have, the more likely you are to prosper in a global environment. Hello, namaste, hola, aije, achlan, zdrazvuche, ni hao ma. I was selected to go to China to study Chinese education. I was teaching them American methods of how to teach creatively. We each bought $25 webcams and we decided that our children should teach each other about their culture and their language and their music. And the Chinese children were just dying to know about American children. And my kids fought in stereotypes. So we were actually learning from the children. I valued uh, a simple use of technology that I thought was very powerful. That's what technology is supposed to do. It increases our capacity as human beings. Our capacity to learn, our capacity to teach, our capacity to create. Anything you can do to get students more engaged is a benefit. To make us more inquisitive, to make us more connected, to, to bring us closer to a greater understanding of, of what this world is all about. They're always learning, they're always on websites, they're always picking up information, whether it's accidentally or on purpose. Most of the game don't exist anymore. Sitting these kids in a classroom and have them listening to a lecture is just simply not going to work with them. And it turns out it doesn't. Clearly you've got a whole lot better than that. If you take a class that's networked through iPads, they could create, with the touch of a button, one version of their story that has everybody's amendations and, and edits onto that single draft so that they could see a kind of universal prototype. I think the largest value in today's world is, is being able to share and collaborate. We have to get excited about the fact that we can connect with others, whether it's teachers connecting with other teachers or globally, and that we can connect with others, learn from others, and make the experience that much more real for our students. I really believes that education is going to change dramatically. It's going to be who you can team with and how quickly you can put together these teams. When all is said and done, we're a creative country. I think that can only be enhanced and strengthened by networking people. If you look at the national education technology standards, they are to become more responsible digital citizens, to be problem solvers, and, and great critical thinkers to learn and become more fluent with managing all of this information. They can analyze, synthesize, evaluate, all those kind of higher order, order thinking skills get enhanced when they're using technology effectively. Very much like this, um, this pen. If, you, uh, if you're able to use this pen effectively, it will help you think better. It will help you think more clearly, it will help you organize. It's, here's our curriculum, how are we going to make it bigger, better, more engaging for our students using technology. Teaching technology is, is knowing when and where to use it. I'm a fan of not using the iPads to replace something we could do elsewhere. And so if we're going to use them as flashcards, then use flashcards. One of the dangers is the idea of raising the concept of technology to the level of, um, of importance beyond what it really needs to be. These tools are much more enticing and engaging. Why not use them if they'll engage the kids? They grew up with mobile technology that they carried with them all the time that they could personalize and make their own. We've got a number of students, kindergarten through second graders, who are blogging. Understanding that your work can be seen and viewed and commented on by people other than the teacher, which is the norm, really raises the bar for how they do their work. This is my blog, and one time I had 42 visitors! 42! We write about things like, um, we write... Like, I like to write about things that happen. I don't really like it writing on paper. So I do it on the computer. This generation, because of their social media, 
writes more than any other generation. They put out thoughts, and that's really important. This young I generation is able to couple all of that with an interesting art and video and kind of put it all together so you present words, art, video, and it's a very creative activity looking very much like really good production. You need help adding your blog to your blog. You need to have both of them up on a different tab. Well, I started about 10 minutes ago. I'm going to put some pictures on it. And I have three facts about magnets, too. And I use the picture for the background. They have uh, a certain osmosis like quality. And they have this ability to tap into the, the very fast changing world uh, of this information age in a way that we fully you know, just cannot possibly understand. It's, it's, uh, it's really mystical. I think they're being rewired differently, yes. I think their brains are being rewired. I think the activity that comes from the sensory stimulation from all of this technology and the way they're thinking about it is rewiring their brains. And I truly think it's for the better. I think the only problem that happens is that it's overloading the brains in many cases and forcing them to be internally distracted. And that's what I'm worried about. We, we as parents and educators need to teach them how to focus for periods of time, then everything will be great. One, two, three, eyes on me. One, two, eyes on you. Oh, but I didn't even get half the eyes. One, two, three, eyes on me. One, two, eyes on you. It is time to save, publish, and shut down. When I first started teaching, we didn't have computers on our desks. Um, then it became where we got computers on our desks, big, wonky computers. Um, and this year I was very lucky. I wrote a grant to get iPads and a smart board in my classroom. So this year I came to school and I have a laptop, a smart board, and 30 iPads for all the kids. So technology has totally changed since I started working here. We can do anything from counting coins, telling time, the kids can track how well they do, what I can see what they need help with. The majority of them use them for the first time in the classroom. Since we've had them in September, they all keep coming in saying their mom got an iPad, their dad got an iPad, we got an iPad for the family. If you had come in here five years ago, you probably would have seen some technology. And then four years ago, you would see more. And then three years, much more. You know, so it's evolved over the years. My kids in this room are learning the higher levels of the new bloom. Um, so the whole idea of creating and expressing themselves. But they're also learning um, basic technology skills of the 21st century. Some kids actually don't have very much experience at home. So I would say there's as much variety in this room in terms of their tech savviness as there is kids' reading ranges, math abilities. Um, I do think it's important though because in the 21st century it will be digital based. We don't neglect art in this room. We still draw and create and, and use our hands. And we certainly don't neglect reading in this room, and we don't neglect math, and we definitely don't neglect technology. Uh, um, me and Griffin are doing, well, there's a whole another side. What is it for? It's for wrapping up the iPads that we're giving to the teachers of Portis Point School and Union Memorial School. Because... Because they want more to They want more to say our teachers, like, they're, they're trying to get, she's like teaching them about a lot of technology. And they want more technology in their room. The other day when we searched, everyone was searching on the webs for shapes because we're doing geometry. Um, it was very hairy for about 45 minutes. After they do it two or three times, we won't need to help them anymore. They'll be fine and they'll be able to do anything that we ask them to. I just think that when you use technology with kids, um, a lot of people put limits or barriers on kids, and kids don't do that, <laughs> you know, and not everybody in here can independently use embed code. Not everybody in here can even do embed code. But if I never thought they could, you know, then, then they never would, and they can.
there's lots of kids in here who can. And when you have a purpose and you want to do something, like a blog entry or something like that, you'll learn how to type. You'll get it figured out one way or another. And, you know, so that's what I think. I think we put barriers on kids. We put ceilings or limits that they just don't have. They're wired differently. Four computers now, we had four two. at one point, so we were half, one foot in, one foot out, and we didn't feel that was was a good place to be just a couple years ago. We were at a point that we needed to make a decision, so we came together, we looked at research, and we decided to, you know, remove them from the classroom. Is that really the best use of our time for the kind of citizens that we want in our society? Is, is, is screen time? regardless of what the child is doing, regardless of the parameters, are the skills, that are the capacities that they're learning really going to evolve into something worthwhile down the road? The, the whole point of like the Mac, this is made for like the, the least inquisitive, least intelligent person to be able to use it. It's not made to be complicated, so it isn't like you have to learn it because it's really hard because you're not going to be able to learn it later. So why rush? Why rush that now whenever things like being outside, you know, connecting with your peers in the moment um, can be so much more valuable in the long run. Dr. Lowell Monkey, he says it takes no more than a couple of months for a child who is not technology savvy to catch up skills wise to their peers. And then the child that's learned how to think is able to take it to the next step. Whereas the child that's been trained to learn the technology takes it only as far as the technology can bring that child. If one gets so absorbed in technology that the person never goes out and has any contact with nature, then it's not that technology is bad per se, but people are using it wrongly. Let's say that you had a beautiful, uh, high-definition photograph of a flower that's right outside your door, or a tree that's right outside your door, and you sit and you look at that. Is it the same thing as going out and looking at the flower or looking at the tree? And it's just not. Looking at representations and having relationships with representations of things is not the same thing as having a relationship with a real thing. We, in our kind of um, culturally impoverished society, don't know that it isn't the same thing. I think that we as human beings are meaning-making creatures. We need to make meaning. We need to. It's, it's like we need air and water, you know, we just need meaning. And the problem with a lot of what there is in our culture is that it's like junk food. I call it junk meaning. You know, becoming wealthy, becoming famous. But it has no sustenance. You can't sustain yourself on junk. You can't sustain yourself on junk meaning. There are certain kinds of desires, especially with um, social media, that we have real and deep human desires and we're accepting substitutes for their satisfaction um, instead of the real thing. It's the human beings that teach you. Um, they, they, you may end up um, you know, going to other sources, but it's going to be some person usually that will ignite a passion. When they reach these technologies, they can be awake to the fact that it's an incredible uh, change in the development of human consciousness. And they can then enter into it with a sense of gratitude, uh, a sense of uh, uh, interest, enthusiasm. I think we need to be alert. I think we need to be really awake uh, as to what's happening. Uh, pay attention. Uh, I don't want to miss anything during this time. And, uh, and we need to protect our kids. Yeah. <laughs>